Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thanks for joining us from across many time zones for this uh, webinar. My name is Guru Madhavan. I am Norman Augustine, Senior Scholar and uh, Senior Director of Programs at the National Academy of Engineering. I offer my welcome also on behalf of National Academy of Engineering President John Anderson and Chair of the Council Don Winter. Under Congressional Charter, the National Academy of Engineering provides advice to the governments, uh, government on matters of engineering and technology. This event is an offering of a new program under development at NAE called FOCUS, the Forum on Complex Unifiable Systems. FOCUS held, held its inaugural virtual forum in late April 2020, and many of you joined us for that event. Thanks for joining us today again. And we especially thank Dassault Systems for helping lay the foundation for focus through their sponsorship. Using systems engineering as the connecting theme, the goal of the focus program is to explore both the perennials and frontiers of complexity in health, security, urbanization and infrastructure, research and education, transportation, economy, environment, modern work, and civic life. You think of any issue with complex engineering interdependencies, focus is interested in that. The notion of unifiability in focus relates to the leveraging of approaches, the capabilities across, across different practice areas of inquiries to foster functional system approaches to complex problems. Unifiability is about crossing boundaries and also about leadership, strategy, communications, and accountability. This focus event is in partnership with NAE's premier publication, The Bridge. Our flagship quarterly, the Bridge is summer 2020 issue centered on the advances in aeronautics, the subject of this discussion today. As an active scene in the so-called motion picture of complex systems, aeronautics has much to offer in terms of workable systems engineering approaches. As we know, with aeronautics, the ambitions are high and the stakes are high. The last issue The Bridge published on this topic was in fall 2004, and that seems like a generation ago given how much advances have occurred in aeronautics. From aero propulsion to hybrid electric aircrafts and risk management to hypersonics and incentive prices, we are going to learn a lot of, uh, about these range of topics from our distinguished speakers today. Before we get started, I wanna to bring to your attention uh, that the bridge has an exciting lineup of issues coming up later this year. The fall 2020 issue is on revisiting nuclear energy, another topic replete the complex interdependencies. This will be out in September. The winter 2020 issue is entirely on the theme of unifiability in complex systems and is being prepared with an astonishing array of perspectives. That'll be out in December 2020. And as a special treat, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the bridge, NAE is publishing a special edition that will take a deeper look at the future of engineering through 50 different lenses and essays. This is not to be missed. Please look out for it. That will also be out in December along with the winter 2020 issue. I'd like to recognize my colleague Cameron Fletcher, who's the managing editor of The Bridge, her associate Penny Gibbs, and the editor-in-chief Ronald Tennyson for guiding these publications, and to my colleague Darul West for helping organize this gathering. Now, before I introduce the editors of the summer 2020 issue on aeronautics, we'll introduce the subject and the speakers. I'd like to add that the interactive portion of this event after the speakers are presented uh, will be made possible by the questions that you post on YouTube live stream. After this airing, the event will be archived on YouTube. Please send the questions to the editors and speakers through your comments and I'll select from them. If you're a tweeter, please use the hashtag NAEFocus or follow the National Academy of Engineering Twitter handle. After the event, let's stay in touch. Our email is focus at nae.edu. Now, it's my joy to introduce the editors, two aerospace industry pioneers, NAE members, John Tracy and Al Romy. John Tracy is a former Boeing CTO and senior vice president of engineering operations and technology. Um, and he has served on the Boeing Executive Council and worked in the aerospace industry for 37 years. Al Romig is the executive officer of the National Academy of Engineering. He was previously the vice president and general manager of Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Company Advanced Development Programs, better known as Skunk Works. He spent the majority of his career at Sandia National Labs, where he was ultimately the deputy lab director and chief operating officer. I will now turn it over to them, and I'll see you again for a Q&A. Al, over to you and John. 
Good day, everyone. I will use that term since I don't know exactly uh, what time of day it is where you're watching this from. But as Guru said, it's actually been 16 years since we've last done uh, an issue of the bridge on aeronautics and aviation. And as he said, a lot has happened over, over those interviewing 16 years. Commercial aviation, of course, is very important to the global economy. In fact, it, it, uh, it employs between, provides between five and 8% of the world's uh, gross domestic product. And it is actually the safest form of transportation that exists. I think we've all heard the anecdote that the most dangerous part of your trip is driving to the airport, not the flight from the airport to your final destination. We're very excited today to hear from a number of the authors that were that were uh, uh, written for the uh, for the last issue of the bridge on aeronautics. We're going to start off with Alan Epstein, who will tell us about. Uh, recent advances in propulsion, looking at aerodynamics, thermodynamics, materials, design, and manufacturing, all intended to improve engine performance, life, safety, and efficiency of the propulsion units. Next, we'll hear from, from John Lankford, who authored the paper that looked at the possibility of an all-electric vehicle. Some very particular interesting problems are, are, are available in that area. It will provide substantially reduced produ produ production of CO2, even though that still provides uh, only about 2% of the greenhouse gases, it's still not zero, but nevertheless it will be important. Then we'll hear from Lourdes Maurice, who will also talk about environmental impacts related to, to, the av to aviation. Then we will move on to Claire Tomlin, who will talk about, the, about autonomy in, in aviation, various aspects, including its safety, its applications, and describing some of the issues involving human machine teaming, neural networks for flight management, and so forth. Also, will be a touch on, on urban air mobility for, uh, from, from a number of the authors. Then we'll move to Kevin Bocut, who will review recent motivations for looking at hypersonic flight. In his case, it'll be air, it'll be air breathing hypersonic flight as opposed to boost glide. But uh, he's an area that he's worked in for quite some time. He can review the motivation for hypersonic flight, where we stand today, and what the challenges are as we go forward into the future and try to realize this dream. And finally, if we take a look at the engineering workforce, we're now at a crossroads. Almost a third of the employees in, in aviation and aerospace are over 55 years old and on the brink of retirement. It's gonna be very, very important for us to make sure that we maintain a vibrant and healthy pipeline of talent for the aerospace industry. One of the ways to do that, as Daryl Pines will tell us, is through the use of competitions and prizes, which are a great stimulant for especially young people to really push the envelopes of technology and really stimulate their interest in a given field. So it's a very exciting, I think, um, array of speakers. It uh, follows, in fact, the order that we is published in the bridge. Um, if you don't have a copy of the bridge, you can download it from our site. It's, it's available in, the P in PDF form. And so with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to my colleague, John Tracy, who will introduce our speakers. John? Very good. Thanks, Sal. Morning, everyone, or good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is. Our first speaker uh, today is Dr. Alan Epstein. Uh, Alan is the R.C. McLaurin Professor Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he also is the uh, former Vice President of Technology and Environment at Pratt & Whitney. So with that, we'll turn the floor over to Professor Epstein. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Aircraft are amongst today's uh, most highly engineered complex systems. And, and by the way, so are their engines. Uh, the $800 billion a year aerospace business is an important sector of the world's economy. About half that is in the US. So it's clearly an appropriate topic for the National Academy. I'm going to focus on jet powered commercial aviation since it accounts for about three quarters of this activity. Some exciting areas like small aircraft, supersonics and hypersonics, I'll leave to subsequent speakers. My focus is on airliner propulsion. The propulsion system represents about 20% of the purchase price of an airliner, but because of its influence on fuel and maintenance, it influences much more the total cost of ownership. Over the past 70 years, the billions invested in engine technology have yielded great gains, including the doubling of overall efficiency from 20 to 40 percent and significant improvements in safety, for example, reducing the in-flight shutdown rate by a factor of a thousand. My focus is on the opportunities and challenges ahead. 
there is potential to realize great gains from new propulsion technologies, including improving the overall efficiency from 40 to 60%, basically doubling the improvement to date, reducing aircraft noise below the urban and ambient, cutting engine development time and cost by a factor of two, and enabling new modes of transportation like urban air mobility. I'm particularly enthusiastic about noise reduction. We've reduced the noise footprint area on the ground by an order of magnitude since the Boeing 707. We have just another six decibels to go. These are all hard problems which require significant investment. And it's not just development. Many, develop, many disciplinary advances are needed. Some people have worked for decades, like aerodynamics, fracture mechanics, and materials. Some are much newer, like probabilistic design. Each opportunity brings challenges. I think the most important is climate change due to its reality and due to its political implications. In 2008, leaders committed that by 2050, aviation CO2 would be half that of 2005, despite 45 years of growth. This requires about a fourfold net carbon reduction per passenger. So we need to reduce both the energy needed and the carbon content of that energy. Since over 93% of aviation CO2 is produced with aircraft with more than 120 seats flying long distances, we need airliner sized solutions. Aviation is currently powered by fossil carbon pumped out of the ground, but we need much cleaner energy. One approach studied is to switch to electric power. May I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, with any known battery chemistry, the airplane might look like this cartoon, all battery, no range. The heart of the matter is that the energy density of jet fuel is 60 times higher than today's best batteries. Even if there were a Nobel Prize worthy breakthrough in battery chemistry, electricity is not a 2050 solution. Uh, next slide, please. As we can see here, the right-hand scale shows that current airliner engines produce less CO2 than a battery-powered airliner would power it off the U.S. grid. Note that this may be different for small aircraft, which are now powered by much less efficient engines. The only path forward is low carbon fuel. Next slide, please. Uh, these low and sustainable alternative jet fuel is by far the most attractive approach. These low carbon fuels can be used in existing aircraft and distribution systems, save 80 to 90% net CO2 and not interfere with food or water. Fuels from many chemical processes are now certified with more coming. As you can see on the left, the energy sources can be the same as for green electric power, solar, wind. We can also use uh, waste, waste energy or the waste energy from other uh, industrial processes. Uh, at the moment, we make only a few hundred million gallons of this fuel a year and cost is an issue. Clearly, both technology and pol policy have a role to play here, but that's another story. In, in conclusion, let me just say that there are great opportunities and exciting challenges ahead. The most important key to this future is attracting very good, very enth enthusiastic young engineers to move aviation forward. And I look forward to hearing what the other speakers have to say on these topics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that detailed uh, bios for each of our speakers are available on the same uh, web, NAE webpage that you registered uh, with. Our next speaker is Dr. John, Jean Boti. Uh, Jean is the CEO and founder of Volt Aero, uh, but probably most of us know him since from 2006 to 2016. He was the chief technical officer of Airbus. Uh, so with that, I'll turn the floor over to Jean to talk about hybrid electric aircraft uh, used to improve environmental impacts in general aviation. Jean. Thanks, Jean. Uh, if we can get the 
first slide, thank you. Uh, as you can see in my slide here, you see two airplanes. One, this is the one behind me, which is the test bed that we have right now. And we are integrating the 10 seats. It's an hybrid electric. And this, in the right side, you see the future airplane, which will be the production one that we're planning to produce, to start production at least for the four seats at the end of 2022. If we could go to the next slide, please. So, uh, in our concept here of airplanes, and, and, and what Alan said before is absolutely true. Uh, we, I've been there before. We, we, we had a, we crossed the channel with, uh, at the time I was Airbus, you know, at VV fan, it was a little electric two-seater that crossed the channel uh, in 2015. Uh, we have made a lot of progress in batteries, but there is no way that we're anywhere closer to where we should be to think about big airplanes. And uh, for us, uh, adding fuel to, uh, and, and again, sustainable fuel, and, and that could go to up to hydrogen in the future, having sustainable fuel added to electric uh, makes a lot of sense uh, when you talk about emissions, when you talk about noise, when you talk about safety, and when you talk about cost of ownership. And I will come back to it because we, we hear a lot of things that in my mind are incorrect uh, these days. So we have developed a modular uh, concept here, four, six, and 10 seats, 330 kilowatts for a four, 480 kilowatts for a six, and 600 kilowatts for a 10. Next slide, please. So um, as you can see, our objective here uh, resumes the four elements I, I, I gave before. And uh, to be able to have enough hours of autonomy and, and being able to create really a, a little regional uh, aviation, uh, taking you point to point and uh, using it a lot also uh, in an electric mode. Uh, all our takeoff and landing are electric. Uh, the cruise, uh, dependent of the, I, I will come back to it, dependent of the, the, the distance, but cruise could be full electric or with rechargeable hybrid. So in order to make this um, kind of a key performance characteristics, you have to have an hybrid. Uh, today, we the technology of batteries does not allow you okay, to, to have this kind of performances that, that you can see here in, in this page. And, and it's not uh, foreseeable you know, uh, in, in, in the next 15 years to come, at least. Uh, and Alan mentioned even Nobel Prize, and, and that's right. I mean, we, we have to take a big quantum leap if you want to, uh, to get to a full electric aircraft uh, with a sizable uh, number of people on board. Next slide, please. So uh, what we have developed uh, in our case uh, is, uh, and, and right now we are preparing uh, the first flight of the 10-seater, uh, which will be a 600 kilowatts. Uh, we have a dual source of energy, uh, and, and that for us also adds another dimension that, you know, we, we, we don't talk about a lot about that in civil aviation because civil aviation is very safe. In general aviation, there is still a lot of issues in terms of safety, okay, and, and the reliability of the airplanes. By having a source of energy being electric uh, and, and, and also for both of them, you have another dimension of uh, you get another big gain in terms of reliability, and I think that that should not be uh, something to underestimate. Uh, you know, for for airplanes uh, for general aviation, I talked about compatibility of biofuels. Uh, you know, our uh, airplane will be biofuel compatible. No problem. Uh, and um, in fact, we welcome uh, a lot in, in the future also uh, hydrogen fuel cells. But the same way we got issues with batteries, today we have uh, problems with the, the fuel cells in terms of power for, uh, I would say, weight uh, ratio. Low noise, uh, we have uh, uh, today uh, already, uh, you know, in, our, uh, in the plane you see behind me, we have already at least eight DBA compared to competition uh, during operations. And uh, we're planning to have no noise during taxi operations. Basically, we will have no turning propellers when you take off, uh, when you go to the tarmac, okay? 
it will be all done by a, a, a motor wheel that will take the, the, the plane uh, to, to the runway. And lower cost of ownership compared to competition in average is 35% lower. Next slide, please. Here, in terms of cost of ownership, I need to qualify. This airplane is what I call an airplane a la carte. Basically, it's got the features of being a pure electric. And if you go from zero to 200 kilometers, uh, it will have it will be pure electric and you use the, the, the thermal energy only as safety, okay? In case you have to have to go to another, uh, for reason of uh, weather or something, you have to go to a, another uh, airport, you can do it and you can use the, the, the range extender to do that for you. If you go from 200 to 600 kilometers, you are in the range of my hybrid. It's, it becomes a range extender. And when you go from 600 to 1200 uh, kilometers, uh, basically to the three and a half hours of flight, you become heavy hybrid, where there you do uh, charge and discharge of the batteries. It is very important to uh, notice, and I said that on my paper on the bridge, that cost of electricity in Europe is cheaper than the cost of fuel. And um, in that case, you have all interest to discharge your batteries that you have on board as much as you can, uh, specifically when you're in the range of zero to 200 kilometers, because you can make significant uh, cost savings. And this will be my uh, next slide, please. Here you see when you compare, you take all the elements, and this is our four seater that uh, you know we have a, a real base with our airplane to be able to compare. Uh, this is uh, compared to a main competitor of today that is uh, uh, the most sold aircraft uh, uh, today that is a conventional one. You can see the most of your economies come from the fact when you run in full hybrid, electric, excuse me, full electric. When you are in light hybrid or when you get into heavy hybrid, you can see that your savings in terms of total cost uh, of ownership uh, become a lot lower. So um, in Absisa, you have the number of uh, flight hours. In Ordinate, you got the cost in euro per hour. And uh, you can see that uh, when I talked before about an average of 35% is because I was combining flights that would be between the three elements going from full electric to light to heavy hybrid. So when you hear uh, lots of people saying that, you know, with an electric aircraft, you can make 80% of savings that, you know, no, there is no miracles into this. It's very much dependent on how much you use it. And, you know, um, we will need on board, we have on board, in fact, in our airplane, uh, a cognitive cockpit that helps you to optimize the flights uh, that's uh, where, you know, the, the pilot, where he needs to go, it just punch, you know, the, 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 the flight from point A to point B and the computer tells him what is the best route. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a brief update here on uh, the fact that, you no, know, uh, even uh, hybrid electric is a, is, is a great technology. It's a, it will be a great aircraft for the future, but you will not solve all the issues for us. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. John Langford. Uh, John is, is the CEO and founder of Electra.Aero. Uh, uh, many, many of us know him as the CEO and founder of Aurora Flight Sciences, and others of us know him as the president of AIAA. So, so John should be well known to all of us. John's talking this morning about electrified aircraft propulsion. So John, please take it away. Thank you very much, John. So uh, the paper that I worked on was uh, on a, a general topic of electrified aircraft propulsion. And my co-author was David Hall, uh, a researcher who I've known both at MIT and at Aurora and has now moved to Penn State University where he's a, uh, a professor there now. Next, next slide. Um, if you could just click through uh, three clicks on this. So there, you know, the, that's good. The basic idea on this is that there are two overriding uh, aspects of aviation today from a passenger point experience point of view. One is congestion, getting to the airport, being in the airport, being on the aircraft. 
And the second is environmental sustainability. Those are big drivers. Next chart. A lot of people look at uh, what's happening on the ground in, uh, in ground transportation, in cars, uh, where electric, uh, there's a revolution taking place in electric mobility. And people naturally ask, is that going to happen in aviation? Next chart. Alan addressed some of this um, previously, but uh, it's important to understand that from a payload range performance, uh, electrification makes things worse. It, uh, it's a very different situation that we face from, from a ground vehicle. This is a notional uh, regional uh, aircraft, uh, a, a twin otter. Uh, this is the payload range performance, if, uh, next chart. We go into this in, in more detail in the, uh, in the article, of course, but this, is the degree, this chart shows the degree of hybridization. If you go from an all electric uh, configuration to the uh, pure turboprop, and the point on this, and it's backed up by numerous other studies with different aircraft. So the, the, the Twin Otter is really just a, a, a representative of, of the category here. Um, that the, uh, using batteries decreases the payload range performance. And that's something that you rarely see in aviation where something that's considered forward progress actually makes the performance of the vehicle, uh, vehicle worse. Next chart. Um, the reason on that is largely shown in the left, uh, the left hand chart. It's the energy, uh, specific energy of current batteries uh, compared to the available energy in carbohydrate, uh, in, in, uh, in fuels, JP8. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the growth trend over the last 100 years in batteries and extrapolate it, um, you see that, that reaching into the range where you can, can uh, power uh, large aircraft is not something that we're likely to see in our lifetime. If you click on this, you'll see in this, um, there's a click, click once, there's brings up uh, sort of a design point of where the state of the art really is uh, for, for a, a, a new design type of, of airplane. You could imagine theoretically getting ranges of a couple of hundred miles uh, out, of a, out of an electric aircraft, uh, next chart. And then you can kind of see that that's in a in a in a in a best case world. As you add all of the reality that comes in with a with a uh, putting an aircraft into through certification and into operation, things like the installation, the safety factors that have to go into that, uh, accounting for takeoff and landing, uh, accounting for reserves, um, the fact that batteries degrade as they're used. Um, you move from something that may look fairly reasonable into something that looks challenging to have even very short durations, 50 uh, kilometers or less. And then when you start to add vertical takeoff and landing, it becomes even more challenging. So these are, by definition, going to be uh, very short range vehicles. Next chart. The... So, so why, why the excitement on electric propulsion then? Um, and and there, are, there are sort of three areas where electric may help buy its way into uh, certain configurations of airplanes. One is on the, uh, the sort of broad category of market potential, where the, the promise of potentially lower noise, certainly uh, reduced emissions, or at least moving the source of the emissions from the aircraft to some other place, uh, as Alan was talking about, the, the cleanliness of the grid matters a lot in the overall calculation of, of uh, environmental sustainability of, uh, of electric airplanes. Um, as, as Jean Bati was showing, uh, there can be some life cycle reductions there. Uh, if you can live with the shortened performance, uh, the battery electric does have a higher uh, efficiency utilization of energy on the airplane. So you may be able to get some direct life cycle cost reductions at the limited ranges that you can get. Um, unconventional missions, that's, that would be the urban air mobility, uh, certainly things like the very long endurance uh, solar powered aircraft that could stay aloft many cycles, diurnal cycles in the, in the stratosphere. Um, and then finally, what we call performance through integration, this idea of being able to distribute the propulsion to set, you know, today the propulsion and the, uh, the aerodynamics of the airplane are largely decoupled. The engine companies make engines, they get bolted onto the airframe. Uh, you can see with electrification, 
the advent of distributed electric propulsion, much higher degrees of integration, uh, things like boundary layer control, uh, distributed electric propulsion, allowing very, very short takeoff and landing, things like that. So next chart. So the, the, uh, the, the sort of main takeaways from, from our paper and the, the, as we looked at this, uh, it, it really backed up the, the conclusions of the Academy's study of, I think, from 2016, that uh, electrifying aircraft propulsion is not a drop-in technology. It's not something that you're just going to go out and replace uh, existing engines on existing airplanes. Fundamental benefit from electrification comes from adding dimensions, new dimensions, to the design trade space. And whether that makes sense depends very much on the mission and the performance metrics that you're, uh, that you're working on. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, appreciate your presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Lourdes Maurice. Uh, Lourdes is a senior advisor for Boom uh, Aerospace. She's going to talk to us about supersonic flight. Many of us know Lourdes is sort of the, the U.S.'s thought leader on aviation and the environment. She had a, a long career at the Federal Aviation Administration where she was the uh, executive Director of the Office of Environment and Energy. And before that, uh, she was um, uh, working at the Air Force Research Lab uh, for, for close to 20 years as well. So Lourdes, uh, over to you. Yeah, um, good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. Um, uh, thank you uh, so much for the invitation to join. Uh, before I talk about um, supersonic aircraft, I do want to acknowledge my co-authors, um, both from Boom, uh, Raymond Russell and uh, Rachel Devine. Uh, hi, guys. Um, thank you. I don't think we would have written the article without you uh, pushing me into it. Uh, when I was asked by uh, the academies um, to, to contribute to this issue on aviation and environment, I chose to focus on supersonics. Now, commercial supersonic flight is not new. All of us have heard about the Concorde. Uh, I had the um, incredible opportunity to fly on the Concorde in 1998. That's my son. Uh, five years later, uh, that uh, magnificent uh, aircraft um, went out of service, a combination of just the costs and, and the, um, the tragic accident. Um, that, that that brought one of the aircraft down, um, as well as just um, post 9/11, uh, the industry w was in quite of a downturn. Uh, but um, if we could flip to to the next slide, we're kind of seeing a renaissance um, in um, in supersonics. We, um, this is an aircraft by Ariane, um, who's working on a bus jet. Um, if we can go to the, to the my next and last slide, which is um, uh, Overture, the aircraft that Boom Technology is working on. And Ariane and Boom are not the only companies in this space. We have seen many announcements. Virgin has gotten to the space. We have heard from Spy, uh, Gulfstream, and Lockheed have been in the space for some time. And NASA has done a tremendous job of keeping uh, the technology ongoing. So, so right now, we're kind of in the verge of having this um, renaissance in supersonic travel. And in a sense, it is inevitable. One of these companies is going to solve uh, the equation, and I uh, firmly believe that. So um, what about the environment? Um, I spend um, a large part of my life um, advancing uh, aviation sustainability. So I certainly would not work on something that I did not believe was going to be compatible with those principles. So when we look about at, um, what we can do with technology with um, supersonic aircraft, we have to remember that we're not talking about the magnificent Concorde. We are talking about decades of advancing technology that we can apply to this aircraft that can improve noise, fuel efficiency, and carbon emissions. Now, um, yes, um, 
climate is certainly um, a, a, an existential threat to the planet. But a more immediate threat to aviation, I always found when I was working day to day on these issues, was community noise. Uh, and in reality, aircraft noise does impact health and welfare. It does impact sleep. It impacts ability to learn. So there, there's some very, very real uh, community impacts. And a supersonic aircraft needs to be very cognizant of landing and takeoff noise. There are regulations for subsonic aircraft, the latest being Chapter 14, which the U.S. calls Stage 5. Um, and, um, you know, we can expect that there probably will be a next um, stage we continue to press. So, um, you know, what can technology do here? Well, probably you're not going to, um, a higher bypass isn't going to work so well. That has really helped um, bring down the noise uh, in subsonic aircraft, but not here. But you do have technologies, you have materials, you have ways of mixing, et cetera. And then you have operations. Uh, and you're talking about uh, brand new aircraft where you're not trying to mimic designs that already exist. So you can, in many ways, design for operations. For example, um, you can use program lapse rate as you're taking off and you can control your thrust and limit the exposure of noise to the community. So I do believe that this aircraft will have noise uh, profiles that will blend in with existing noise. So then uh, move on to climate, uh, which a number of you have, have noted of how much of a threat this is. Um, um, fuel efficiency, of course, you know, we can't kid ourselves. We all uh, know the physics. And of course, if you fly faster, uh, you're going to consume more fuel. But if you go back uh, and look from the Concord technology to now, there are a lot of efficiencies that you can apply. Uh, but most of all, just materials and composite materials and such. I mean, just um, all you have to do is take a look at a chart of fuel efficiencies. I uh, worked for a number of years on what ended up being the first fuel efficiency standard for aircraft. And if you look at um, if the number of aircraft, you kind of see the 787 just way off the chart. Uh, and the use of composites there led to that jump. So when we're looking at this aircraft, we have to think of the number of years of technology advancement. And then also think that the supersonic aircraft are at the beginning of the S-curve of technology development. As we see this aircraft come into service, uh, we will see technology advances continuing to come in. Which then, but um, as I said, you cannot, you know, physics is physics. So what else can help us decarbonize? Well, gosh, I remember, um, I don't remember the exact year. It's been uh, at least a decade. And Alan and I and a couple of others were testifying uh, before the House uh, Committee on Science on sustainable alternative fuels. And at the time, we weren't talking about hundreds of thousands of gallons. There probably had just been hundreds of gallons. Um, we were on the verge uh, of uh, qualifying these fuels. Uh, they're not uh, in the billions of gallons yet, but they're certainly being used operationally. And as Alan said, more and more are coming uh, into use. Now, the advantage that a supersonic aircraft would have is again, is a new clean sheet design. So this aircraft uh, and uh, certainly Bloom and other manufacturers have noted that they are designing this aircraft to function on 100% um, sustainable fuel. Right now, the fuels are only approved to you for use up to about a 50% plan because there are compatibility issues Will 100% happen? I don't know, but I know that these aircraft are, are going to advance that technology because they're very much uh, thinking of those fuels from, from the ground up. Uh, and then lastly, um, when you look at what the industry promised, and Alan uh, talked about that uh, industry goal, and aviation should be very proud in that it's really a sector that was out there um, 
putting out um, impressive goals for um, looking at environment, you're not going to do it with just technology. You're not going to do it with just operations or fuels. Uh, in 2016, the International Civil Aviation Organization did come to an agreement uh, called Corsia, which was um, an, uh, a way in which you can buy offsets such that you can be um, carbon neutral. Uh, and the goal is to maintain 2020 levels. Of course, what, will, uh, what that means in COVID world remains to be seen. But the reality is that this aircraft, uh, supersonic aircraft, are going to enter into service uh, well into the 2020s. And uh, they, uh, the routes are going to be um, pretty much international. So they are going to be part of the growth. They are going to be covered by Corsia. So I believe that supersonics is coming back in this wonderful age where we are so focused on environmental sustainability. Uh, so when I chose to um, join this industry, um, I kind of thought to myself, you know, yes, it is inevitable. And in a way, it is that environmental drive, um, something that, that again, I've I'm pretty much dedicated a large part of my life to that is going to help make this aircraft a reality. Is it easy? Uh, no, of course not. But is it worthwhile? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I will close with, um, you know, I wish that this was done in Spanish because the praise is used so much better in my native language, but I've done my best to translate it. And that's if the things that are worth doing were easy, everyone would be doing them. It seems sometimes that everyone's working on supersonics and it's just such an exciting area. You know, folks talked about the age uh, of the workforce. If you look at uh, Boom or Arian, et cetera, it's a very young and vibrant workforce. Well, um, again, if those things were easy, everyone would be doing them, but there's um, a, a number of inventors and dreamers that are going to make this aircraft a reality, and they are going to be quiet, and they are going to be carbon neutral. Um, so thanks so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Lourdes. Thanks for sharing your excitement about uh, supersonic flight. Uh, we're fortunate to have as our next speaker, Professor Claire Tomlin. Claire is one of the absolute leaders in terms of autonomy uh, in aeronautics. Uh, she holds the Charles de Soar Chair in Engineering as a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering uh, and Computer Science at the University of California, Berkeley. So with that, Claire, please take it away. Thanks very much, John, and thanks for inviting me to speak uh, this morning. And I'd like to... Um, uh, acknowledge my, my co-author, J.P. Clark, um, who uh, we, we wrote this article together, and, um, and, uh, and it's, it's a big area, autonomy and aeronautics. And so we focused in this um, on a very quick, broad brush, and then we focused on some of the topics that are close to our hearts. So autonomy in aeronautics, it engenders visions of a future in which aircraft operate independently of human control. And whether they operate with um, human air traffic control or a future of automated air traffic control, the idea is that humans are removed from um, some of the control loops. So today, how, how we think of the future is, um, it sort of varies among individuals, but but today we do have varying levels of automation which do operate without continuous human interest, without continuous human oversight. Um, let's go on to the next slide, please. So let's start by talking about air traffic systems and air traffic control. On the left, we have um, kind of a stylized cartoon of um, aircraft in a piece of an air traffic control system showing the various levels of criticality that air traffic controllers deal with, for example, in collision avoidance. On the right is again a stylized picture of the, um, the modes of automation of an aircraft under air traffic control and how air traffic control might, um, which is now done in a human controlled way, 
um, guide an aircraft from its origin to its destination through sectors of airspace. So one of the questions in automating um, some um, of the components of air traffic control are how do we do this safely? How do we automate some of what controllers do manually today? And in the, the reason or one of the key reasons to do that is to improve the overall efficiency, improve strategic allocation of capacity constrained resources by allowing controllers to take on roles not previously possible. Um, for example, in higher level monitoring and flow optimization. And, and that is um, the, the, the way that this is um, in, could be done is to put some of the autonomy on the aircraft, some of the uh, decision-making for collision avoidance, for example. So, so to do this, um, we're not there yet. Innovations are needed. Um, so first of all, how to characterize the uncertainty when you automate something like um, collision avoidance and propagate this through to the decision-making. Um, how to do the automation. Do you mimic what is done today in, um, in a system which is largely human controlled? Um, how do you make it work with humans that are going to be, even if they're removed from the loop, they're still going to be there for the foreseeable future um, in some aspect of control or oversight? And, um, and how do you make this responsive, this whole system responsive to societal and public needs? So we've talked today already about efficiency and safety and also the environmental aspects. Uh, next slide, please. And, um, and we talked about new kinds of aircraft today. So on the left, um, this is uh, Amazon's concept of um, one of its modes, new modes of delivery. And on the right, we have um, one of the uh, competitors, uh, Lilium, in the air taxi space. Um, and this is a, an electric um, uh, VTOL aircraft concept that Lilium is working with. So these aircraft um, and the kinds that we've seen today are going to exhibit much higher levels of autonomy than we see in our civil aircraft. Um, and so there's the, the idea is to try to design an air traffic system which safely incorporates these new airspace applications enabled by these new platforms and driven by business needs. But we're not there yet. There's innovations needed. And the innovations include um, are focused around automation. So what's needed? Detect and avoid. How do you do that? Again, collision avoidance. How do you do that safely? Um, aware to land functionality, one of the most critical functions of these aircraft. How do you determine that and do that safely? Um, autonomous contingency management, just some of the challenging aspects in introducing more autonomous aircraft into the air traffic system. Next slide, please. So we've talked about um, many things, but there's two I'd just like to focus in, on in these last two slides. And the first is safety. Um, Okay, so the first three bullets, characterize unsafe states, unsafe configurations of the system and prove that the system will never reach them. That's kind of fundamentally what we'd like to do to be able to automate some of this technology. Design the system to be robust to disturbance and, how, and design it to degrade gracefully under faults and make it secure. So model some malicious attack, so a security system and design for it. So all three of these first three bullets, um, they need you to account for ahead of time the things that could happen in the system. So what if we don't account for these? What if we didn't think of them? What if we didn't anticipate them? We need a system that is safe regardless of our failure to um, account for in the design things that might have happened to the system. And so one of the big areas that um, is, a, I think, a very exciting area right now is to use um, new concepts from autonomy, in particular artificial intelligence, AI, to try to account for some of these things on the fly. So, for example, in perception, and this is um, a big area in robotics, and now it's moving towards some of these autonomous systems. You've seen it in autonomous cars. For perception, what does that mean? It means that the system, using its sensors, for example, cameras, takes in information 
and then perceives what the state of the environment is um, accounts for uncertainty and then tries to make decisions based on that uncertainty. The best algorithms for perception now use deep learning and that's going to continue. But deep learning is not safe, as we've all heard. There are, um, uh, you know, there, there, it's impossible right now to characterize or to analyze what a, a deep neural net, that, that a deep neural net will always give the correct or the, the, the decision that you expect it to give. So one of the exciting aspects in autonomy is to try to think of how to, how to make AI safe and how to, um, how to characterize the region of the system of the environment, constraints on the environment, so that a system with AI in the loop can be characterized as safe. And that's typically what we call introspective environment modeling. The best we can do right now is define the environment that our system is safe with respect to, and anything outside the environment, we can't prove any, we can't prove the safety of the system with respect to. Again, safe contingency analysis. Um, let's go on to my final slide, please. And finally, I'd like to talk about a very important uh, aspect of these systems that I touched on before, which is human-centered automation. So the control authority in these systems is going to be shared for the foreseeable future between human and automation. So we talk about human machine teaming where the roles of the human and the machine are optimized to work well together. We don't do that very well now in many systems. It's very important that the automation be designed so that the human who's working with it understands what the automation is doing. Um, there are um, really you know, wonderful examples of, of human machine teaming for example, in enhanced pilot support, that exists today, a loyal wingman program, that exists today. Um, but in terms of you know, um, innovations needed to, to, to make this a pervasive technology, human-centered automation, we need to develop tools to, so that the automation can understand the human behavior and complement it and aid in completing tasks. Again, AI comes into the picture. How do we develop parametric models of human behavior, perhaps you know, rational human behavior or noisily rational human behavior? Well, to do that, we need lots and lots of data. We need models, and we need to understand how to develop these algorithms so that we can, um, so that we can certify safety. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I'd ask uh, the people viewing online to take a moment while the speakers are speaking and make sure you're sending your questions in that we'll be going over after the next two speakers. So please take some time to write questions in for any of the speakers and we'll be going over those at the end. Our next speaker is Dr. Kevin Bocut. Uh, Kevin is a principal senior technical fellow and chief scientist of hypersonics for the Boeing company. And he's gonna talk to us about hypersonics. Kevin. Uh, thank you, John, and hello, everybody. Um, imagine uh, being able to fly between just about any two cities in, in the world in two or three hours. Um, well, that is, uh, to do that requires flying at about Mach 5, which is the speed regime we call hypersonic. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, we've actually been flying hypersonic for a very long time, first time in 1949, and since then we use rockets to propel ourselves to hypersonic speeds, primarily to go in and out of space or for missiles. Um, the problem is that um, that's okay for going fast, but it's not a practical means of getting from point A to point B on the Earth for, you know, for a private passenger. For fundamental physics and engineering reasons, it's hard to do that safely enough and economically enough. So the, the key to doing that is air breathing propulsion, just like we have in commercial airplanes today. The reason for that is the, those engines do not have to carry, those vehicles don't have to carry their own oxidizer like a rocket does. So that plot in the, in the bottom there, basically it's just showing fuel economy for different propulsion systems. You see rockets at the bottom very low, has to carry its own oxidizer and consume it. Uh, air breathing engines are, are very high. A, a subsonic flight like we do today, incredibly high fuel efficiency. 
that efficiency goes down with speed, but it still remains higher than a rocket and enables practical high-speed flight. Now, one of the problems is um, the turbo machinery we use today, turbofan engines, they become too hot. The compressors and turbines become too hot when you get above about Mach 3, where the SR-71 flew. So we've solved that by taking out that turbo machinery and using the motion of the vehicle through the air to compress the flow um, instead of uh, turbo machinery, and that's called a ramjet. But even a ramjet using shockwaves to drive the flow to subsonic speed, doing that process also heats the air, and eventually it gets too hot as well. So a couple of researchers from NASA in the 50s came up with the idea, well, why shock the flow down to subsonic? Let's leave it supersonic and try to burn fuel in a supersonic stream. Hence the, uh, the, the technology supersonic combustion ramjet engines. Next slide. Now that concept has been pure theory and a research for almost 50 years. Then finally in, in 2004, NASA finally flew a scramjet and proved it worked. It's been deemed the Wright Brothers flight of hypersonic. It proved that you could actually use a scramjet to propel a vehicle. And then about uh, a little less than 10 years later, um, we did the same thing, but in a, in a, in a practical way in, in the X-51 where the Air Force working with industry, flew a scramjet engine um, on this X-51 vehicle for three and a half minutes until it ran out of fuel. This is deemed the Lindbergh flight of, uh, of hypersonics to prove the practicality of hypersonic flight, that you could actually turn this into an operational system. And in that three and a half minutes, flying at about a, a Mach 5 or a, a mile per, per uh, second, it uh, flew over a couple hundred miles. Next slide. So, um, so getting back to the benefit of this, um, uh, this shows the flying from about LA to Tokyo, how long it takes. That's about 12 hours in a subsonic airplane. As you go faster, how much time can you save? And you can see that when you get up to about Mach 4 to 5, um, you can uh, save 75% of the time. So you can get there in about three hours instead of 12 hours. It's also interesting to note that if you go much faster, you're not gonna get much benefit. The world's just not big enough to, 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 to yield the benefit of going much faster than that. And at those speeds, you could actually cross the ocean, do a business trip, and come back in the very same day. And that's what the compelling uh, argument of, of this fast flight is you can get there much quicker, save a lot of time, and even do international day trips. Next slide. So Boeing and, uh, and several other companies over the past uh, couple of years have been looking at, you know, how would you fly hypersonic, but what does it take? How do you design an airplane? What technologies are required? And it's very different than uh, uh, even a supersonic airplane. You're in a regime where it's very hot, the airframe's hot, you have to use different materials. The propulsion system has to operate from takeoff, subsonic speeds all the way to hypersonic speed. So the engine architecture, how it's integrated on the airplane is very challenging to make it operate well across that entire uh, speed regime. Um, how we uh, design the aerodynamics uh, is different. Um, we have to use thermal management. We actually use the fuel as a heat sink to cool not only air going through the engine, but parts of the structure. Um, the air that goes into the cabin that you breathe is going to be cooled by the fuel. Um, we might have to use synthetic vision because of the, the heat on the outside of the airframe, et cetera. And a vehicle like this could actually serve as the first stage of a two-stage orbit system that operates more like an airplane than a rocket and makes uh, going to space more routine and affordable. Next slide. So, um, so we've been tackling those technical challenges. Uh, people often ask, well, what's different today than the Concord era? And there's a lot that's different. Um, first of all, we have a computer simulation. We can simulate the physics inside a computer. We can use mathematical optimization to, to design much better, more efficient vehicles. We have much um, lighter and higher temperature materials today propulsion systems that are more efficient and lighter. We have a very advanced ways of managing that heat. Um, we have lightweight electric systems. There's also challenges. Um, many of them have been touched on by Lords. Environmental challenges primarily. Greenhouse gases, we can manage those with synthetic fuels. But then there's also ozone depletion from emissions at high altitude. Sonic boom limits over land flight. Now, it turns out when you fly faster, you gotta fly higher, and higher altitude mitigates booms. So that could be an advantage. And there's some unique aspects of certification as well. Uh, just because of the nature of the vehicle, it's hot, it's flying high, and, and there are new things that have to be tackled there. And next slide, and I'll uh, close by just saying that um, 
that uh, hypersonic flight, although challenging, is a, a, a very uh, fascinating. And, and once we have it, it'll it'll, uh, it'll change the world we live in. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate your talk on hypersonics. Um, our final speaker this morning is uh, Professor Daryl Pines. Most of us uh, have known Daryl for 10 years or so, at least as the dean of the University of Maryland, but he's got a new office now. He's the president of the University of Maryland. So same location, different office. Uh, Daryl's going to talk to us this morning about something that impacts every other single area, and that's how do you inspire innovation? How do you make sure the next generation of engineers is going to be there when we need them? Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, President Pines. Thank you, John. Great, grateful. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky with all the other uh, innovative speakers in front of me. Um, they really are a testament to uh, our field, aeronautics and astronautics. And one mechanism in which it has brought many innovators, as my colleagues are, to our field to advance it and to enhance economic development and innovation has been the use of aerospace prizes and competitions to inspire uh, the next generation of the workforce. So my article was written in terms of the aerospace prizes inspire the five eyes, I call it the five eyes of success. And in the United States, economic growth and competitiveness depend on the capacity to innovate. Innovation and entrepreneurship in aerospace have historically kept the United States at the forefront of technology advances and spurred economic growth, creating new industries such as commercial uh, transportation of cargo and humans, uninhabited aerial systems, as is mentioned previously by my colleagues, hypersonic systems, other civilian and military systems, and more importantly, the private commercial space travel and exploration industry. A key catalyst for many of these innovations has been the creation or the launching of aerospace prizes and competitions. Uh, next chart, please. So I call it the five eyes of success and they are imagination. Does it capture the attention and excitement of people? You know, humans have this incredible excitement about being three-dimensional. We're all two-dimensional, so we do that every day, but going three-dimensional is really still inspirational to people and not the world's population can still do it very easily. So there's this imagination with the third dimension and going into the air or into the space. There's invention that, that takes us there. Does it inspire new designs, devices, or systems? And of course, there's innovation. And in that context, can it be monetized? You know, can it derive value um, for society and then uh, spur economic growth and job development? And finally, what's the investment? Does it inspire a 5x, 10x use of resources to make it happen? And then more importantly, what is the impact, the societal impact? What are the outcomes? Does it generate jobs, gross domestic product, and of course, transportation? Next chart, please. Competition and its prizes are not unknown to all of us humans. It's been going on for years. In fact, our field has advanced because of some historical prizes that were given out much earlier than the beginning of aeronautics. For example, in the 1700s, when we were navigating or the British were navigating across uh, the entire globe, one of the most important inventions and accomplishments was something that was launched through the Longitudinal Prize in 1740, where the British Parliament offered by the act of uh, amount of 20,000 pounds for a solution which could provide longitude within a half a degree. Why? They were losing ships because they were lost back in those days. And John Harrison came up with the Harrison clock, which had an accuracy of a half a degree or two minutes of time. And that was huge and also for advancing navigation, which advances navigation in aeronautics. The DARPA Grand Challenge that you all remember from 2003 was a way to advance autonomy, autonomy for autonomous vehicles. We would not be here today if it wasn't for the DARPA Grand Challenge. And in that very first Grand Challenge, if you may recall, no one won the prize, but the, and the, and the vehicle that went the furthest only went eight miles out of a hundred mile course. And the only reason why I know that because I was there as a DARPA program manager. We then reiterated that competition a year and a half later. And there were three finishers. And it was Stanford that won the prize because people love to be first. 
They love competitions and it brings new audiences to these um, challenging problems. But most importantly, it advances technology in a much more accelerated way than it would normally have advanced. And then finally, you guys are all aware of the Ansari X Prize and the Google X Prize that followed it. And it allowed space, commercial space launch systems, both in the air and access to space as a way to advance our commercial space industry. And by the way, that's how SpaceX came out of it. They did not win it, but they came out of that competition. So competitions have been used throughout history. Next chart, please. So what's the effects of aerospace prizes? Well, what I have found in my studies is that it leads to disruptive advances in the state of the art of a particular technology. It could just, it could just have been navigation, or in Kevin's case, it could have been hypersonics if a small portion of the technology was focused on in a sort of competitive way. It leads to new inventions and creative solutions to achieve the same overall goals. If there's an interaction and collaboration of diverse individuals that it brings to the actual problem that would not may have normally come to that problem without the constructs of a prize or a competition to solve that complex problem. It inspires innovation and entrepreneurship leading to new processes and companies, and in some case, an entire new industry. And finally, it's a change of culture to extent that a creative mindset becomes a foundational part of an institution known as, and, known and, and its tradition. There have been over 50 major prizes that were offered in aeronautics before 1929, including for speed, for distance, for transcontinental flight, and for transoceanic flight. This is what advanced our field, uh, not just the technologies, but the excitement of being first to uh, deliver those innovations. Next chart. So I'll just show with we'll highlight a few of these major aerospace prizes throughout time. All of, of course, all of you might be aware of the Ortigue Prize, which was, of course, won by the famous uh, Charles Lindbergh on the flight across the, Atlant the Atlantic Ocean and arrival in Paris from New York. Um, you, you may be, le be less aware of the first transatlantic flight between Europe and America was actually done um, by John Alcock and Arthur Brown. It's a less known competition, but it was indeed a competition put forth by the London Daily Mail. You're probably familiar with the Henry Kramer Prize. And I know Dr. Langford is, this is something that he tracked very closely uh, in his activities before he started his current firm and he started Aurora Flight Sciences. One of the impetus for Aurora Flight Sciences was some work that he did as the project leader and director of the Daedalus project was with a human powered aircraft and where he learned how to build lightweight structures that could fly at high altitudes and in a very low Reynolds number environment that led to his accomplishments with Aurora Flight Sciences. So thank you, John, for the work that you did there. Um, and we all now are more familiar with the most recent advancement of technology for personal air vehicles, which is the GoFly Prize, which still has not been won. It was sponsored by John's former firm, which is Boeing, and Kevin's current firm, which is also Boeing. And it was a great competition because people want to be vertical and it inspired a whole bunch of uh, innovators to try to win this competition. And of course, the interest in flying uh, as an individual has been around for years. And so this GoFly Prize has excited the competition of a community to really try to achieve those goals. Uh, next chart. So what are the benefits of competitions and prizes? Well, it's interesting. It shines a spotlight on a particular problem or opportunity. You only pay for the results if people achieve them. So it doesn't cost you much because you just put up a prize and then you stand back and let it happen. It targets an ambitious goal without, hopefully without violating the laws of physics, without predicting which team or approach is most likely to succeed. The reach is beyond the usable, typical people who work on the problem. It brings in diverse talent that you, you won't even think might try to work on that problem. It also stimulates the private sector investment, many times greater than the original prize purse, 5X, 10X times brings up the discipline perspectives to bear on a particular complex solution. And it inspires risk-taking by offering a level playing field for all to follow. And it establishes clear target metrics and validation protocols. And in terms of workforce, it inspires the young people to wanna to get into our field of aeronautics. That is the most exciting part of what competition and prizes in aerospace does. Next chart, please. Thank you. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I look forward to any questions that may come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daryl. Um, appreciate your remarks there. At this point, we're going to turn it over to uh, Guru.
who's got some uh, questions that have come in from the audience. If you still have questions, please send them in uh, and we'll get, get them to our speakers. So, so John, moderator's prerogative here. I, I have a question for Alan and perhaps uh, Jean and John would want to weigh in as well. And that is, you know, there's a limit to how large we're going to be able to make, make fans on engines and still have them fit in the airplane, which opens the question of distributed propulsion, perhaps electrically driven, which now might lend itself to a hybrid. So what are your thoughts, Alan, on the opportunities and challenges of, of ultimately moving to a uh, distributed fans for improved uh, propulsion efficiency? Well, of course, it, uh, one person's multiple engines and somebody else's distributed fans. Um, if we went back to four engine airplanes as the 707, 747, A380 are, you could easily go to 25 to one bypass ratio without, uh, uh, without doing anything extraordinary. The real question is what's the benefit to distributed propulsion? And I think it's more to what uh, John alluded to, which is giving the aircraft more capability uh, rather than uh, reduced fuel consumption, if that's what we're looking at. And uh, to do boundary layer ingestion like John's D8 airplane, you don't have to go to distributed fans. John? No, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think there are some, some areas, um, certainly in the uh, distributed electric is, has enabled the eVTOL uh, movement. We'll, we'll see if that actually leads to any practical uh, vehicles, but but certainly it's enabled uh, the, the activity in that area. Um, and then uh, you know I'm a big believer in the in the use of distributed electric for propulsive lift uh, blowing to enable really uh, short takeoff and landing. But uh, but to your point, I, I do think those are going to be um, niche applications that uh, where, where you can derive specific identifiable mission benefits. Thank you. If, if I may add something, uh, this is Jean here. Uh, in our case, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, our airplane is distributed propulsion or uh, our test bed here. It's got the three um, propellers, two in the front electric and one in the back that is hybrid. And for the next flight, the next airplane, excuse me, production one, we will go back to only one rear module. And to be honest with you, we have not seen the benefits today uh, due to the complexity uh, of bringing distributed propulsion. I'm talking about fixed wing now, I'm not talking beetles, but in terms of fixed wings and in terms of you know up to 10 passengers like we're doing here, we have honestly not seen the benefits of uh, keep going with uh, distributed propulsion at this point. Lots of complexity. You, know, you still want a pilot to be able to uh, have his uh, pi private pilot license or his commercial pilot license without uh, adding a, a lot of complexity. And the system is already very complex uh, with only one big power module that could, can go up to 600 kilowatts. Thank you. We have a number of questions and I thank everyone for sending their uh, thoughts, insights. Um, the first question that I'm going to pose to the entire panel uh, that includes the editors here is a blend of two separate questions and it fundamentally relates to the realism of urban air mobility. Uh, and uh, the specific question is how will it differ from um, kind of the Jetsons kind of mentality, um, what's needed to achieve it, implemented in existing urban infrastructure and make it economically accessible. A related extension is, does the proliferation of video uh, teleconference technology uh, really alter the economics of super and hypersonic commercial flight? Um, I might start uh, with a comment um, about the realism of urban air mobility. In, in writing our article, JP and I had the opportunity to talk with a number of the firms that are leading uh, the, um, in both the design of, of vehicles as well as the design of concepts for urban air mobility. And, um, and we saw a, a range of interesting responses, especially as it comes to autonomy. 
and and these are these are realistic uh, concepts that are being designed now in concert with vehicles being designed, um, which uh, which are being tested in terms of the um, you know the business proposition of introducing air taxis into um, urban areas, and the the interesting thing about autonomy is that. You know, one firm um, predicts that at the when they introduce their vehicle into uh, the infrastructure, it will first be a piloted, fully piloted vehicle, like an, an air taxi with a driver. Another firm is introducing a concept which is fully autonomous. So the the vehicle can't be, you know, there'll be a there'll be a pilot in there, but the pilot will be hands off. Um, the the amount of work that's been done in developing the concepts indicate that this is very um, and their and the results of these studies indicate that this is a very viable concept in some form for some of our major and urban areas like the Bay Area where it um, well pre pandemic it it could take three hours to get from one side of the bay to the other um, I think video conferencing has um, you know, and has changed the way we do things. Um, yet uh, in the past, the introduction, when video conferencing was first introduced, it only increased afterwards the amount of air travel because everybody's meeting each other and then they want to go and physically meet each other afterwards. So it remains to be seen, but, um, but it's interesting the, the relationship between video conferencing and then the proliferation of air travel. Uh, this is this is Alan. Let me address the the vehicle side of it, which is you can go back to the 18th century and see people's visions for flying air taxis off of buildings and around the uh, urban environment. And particularly, the end of the 19th century saw a lot of that optimism. And over this century, people have been trying to build flying cars and taxis since soon after the Wright brothers uh, made their first flight. So you might ask, what's different? We're engineers. And so one thing that's different is everybody worried about your neighbor flying home from the bar over your house. And as Claire pointed out, uh, autonomy and uh, GPS and all of the advances in, in uh, avionics indicate that there may be a solution there in the relatively near term. The other challenge was reliable propulsion. And gas turbines are reliable enough, but they're not cheap enough to talk about in the scale. I'm old enough to remember Hub Express, which was a helicopter airline that flew around the 495 and 128 peripheral highways in Boston into Logan Airport. It was scheduled. You'd call them up and reserve a seat. And the last stop was the parking garage, the hotel next to MIT. Helicopters are VTOL aircraft. They fly fast enough, they fly far enough. The neighbors hated it because of noise and fears about safety. So the success of these, and even the near term, depends upon three things, I believe. One is a price that's reasonable for the vehicle. And frankly, these vehicles are the complexity of a light a uh, very light jet, so I don't see why they should cost any less in, in the near term. And then community acceptance, which means getting the uh, noise down to a very low level, which I think is technically feasible. And then operating them in a way that's safer than the main air transportation system. And I think few people realize what an immense effort airlines, manufacturers, and authorities put in keeping that safe. So it's a giant challenge uh, to go forward, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility, I'd say. Marcus, would you like to add something here? Uh, yes, yes, I would. Uh, I did want to comment on um, the economic viability and is there going to be a market for supersonic and hypersonic pulse? pandemic world, um, it, now that we have video, well, you, you know, I mean, if I, um, I thought about that immediately and I thought about my years of negotiating environmental standards and we did all kinds of things uh, over the phone and this and that, but it never worked 
until we came together and we, we sat together for, you know, a week or two weeks or what have you and could see each other and talk to each other. So I think that video um, is certainly helpful. It's helping us continue through the pandemic, but that human connection, that desire to be with people and to see each other, that is always going to be there. And I think that folks are going to travel. There's going to be a pent up demand. Uh, and I think that, you know, I mean, I myself experienced supersonic flight. It was uh, wonderfully convenient. I think it's going to be there. Now, I wish this wasn't so much aeronautics, well, but I'm going to use an example from the fashion industry. The reality is that I could have, you know, um, handbag A and it serves um, a purpose, but lots of people invest money in designer handbags and shoes and such. So I can, I think that uh, questioning that there's a market for a technology, which I think as it becomes more prevalent, it's going to be just like cell phones, et cetera, and available to everyone. It's, it's there uh, and I think it's inevitable. Um, yeah, and I did want to make a quick comment on uh, advanced air mobility since I was on the academy study last year. I also think that is inevitable. Um, and yes, there's uh, lots of challenges, et cetera. But after I finished the study, I wanted to try it. Uh, and I was in the Bay Area with my son. So I just, you know, got on the Boom app and um, got myself a ride to Napa Valley. And, and it was, you know, it very easy and convenient. Now, sadly, Boom has gone out of business, but someone else will come along. So I, I think the advances we're talking about are inevitable and will happen. Very good. Thanks. That's, that's a good point. So does Kevin may have a quick point or two on this. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Um, I, I just to um, bolster it a little bit. Um, you know, with this this COVID nineteen has been a, a quite a great experiment with this virtual connecting and so forth. And and as we've done it over the past five or so months, we've also learned the limitations of the virtual connections, the uh, productivity, the ability to. Uh, train people the ability. It, it, so it, I really do. I agree with Lords that um, um, I believe that that it's not going to really change the demand for travel. And someone mentioned that it may actually increase it. Our ability to connect and, and know about people and and be introduced to people electronically could actually increase the demand. You know, this has been a topic that's been around for a couple of decades. This discussion. And now that we've got technology, is it going to reduce air travel? And what we've actually seen is that air travel has continued to increase. Yeah, we've hit a bump in the road. We'll get past COVID in in a year or so, and uh, things will go back uh, to gangbusters. And I think demand will uh, will will be there. Very good. Excellent point. Uh, our challenge now is to land the panel plane on time, <laughs> and I don't think that's going to be possible. So, but we have a number of questions more coming in, and uh, I'm going to try to blend uh, um, a couple of questions here. Um, I think we'll take a deflection here and talk about a meta uh, question here about the organizational design. What are the broader implications of the kinds of technologies that we are talking about on the design of the organizations or what the organizations could enable or disable um, in terms of our thinking. Um, the older organization, as the questioner puts it, uh, are so separated by function that they kind of, um, they often inhibit the new technologic advances we are talking about. So um, any uh, comment on that? But of course, we also, as uh, Al uh, Romig mentioned in his opening comments, um, that the aerospace industry also has an older worker population. And the education also needs to change um, and the workforce uh, demands need to be planned out carefully. In a way, also an organizational design uh, question here. So who wants to reflect on this broad question? Um, this is Kevin, I'll, I'll, I'll start it. Um, I agree with uh, the point that was made. Um, one of my areas of research and, and, and applying it is the multidisciplinary design optimization. That's, that's how I've actually been able to design hypersonic airplanes. It's really impossible to design them using the methods of aircraft design that you know have been around since the Wright brothers. 
And and because of that, um, you know, stove piping, you know, aerodynamics from structures and um, doesn't work. Um, it has to be integrated. Uh, you have to consider all the interactions, um, how we do, how we change organizationally to to improve that. Um, I'm not. Uh, I don't have a lot of clarity on that, but it does, I do know that it needs to change. And it, there's a lot of resistance when you have a, a current organization that is stove piped and broken into a discipline. How you break those boundaries and bring it together. Um, people try it. I mean, basically, you just gotta you gotta organize in a way that breaks those boundaries and uh, and and avoids those artificial boundaries between the disciplines. Oh, it, it, John here in the I think it was the late 1980s. This this same issue was realized, and integrated product teams or life cycle product teams were born with the sole purpose of making sure that stovepipes were broken down by organizing around the product rather than around geography or profit and loss centers, et cetera. So having a product focused organization, I think has been the way that has been successful in the past. And I personally think that's the way it'll be successful in the future. Very good. Yeah. Sure. Since we're coming by time here, I'll uh, move on to the next uh, uh, question here again uh, uh, in a, in a larger frame, what, uh, in your view, are some of the most critical professional skills to further realize the advancements in uh, aeronautics? And uh, if I might add, uh, looking at the changing nature of teamwork, both on individual preparation, the talent and the competency, as well as the augmented teamwork, machine supplemented, machine supported uh, work. So how do we think about professional skills going forward, keeping in mind the advancements needed? Um, if I could jump in on that one, and, and I think it goes right back to the last question. Um, it's something that I think we face in our academic departments, in our professional societies like the AAA and in all of the companies, which is that the new technologies, which primarily go to the kinds of things Claire was talking about in autonomy, um, put us in a position where our entire education system, our organizational design, and the training of the people who are leading our organizations is all um, different from the most critical skill sets for future, um, for, for advancing the next step in, in, uh, in aeronautics and space, which has to do with autonomy, um, robotics, uh, machine learning. And um, um, it's also, it goes to the, to the workforce development questions because we're now not competing just Boeing versus Northrop versus Gulfstream or something. We're actually competing against all the tech companies and all of the automotive companies for the, for the most critical set of skills uh, in the future of our organization. And that I think permeates everything about what we're doing. And it's, a, it's an underappreciated and under um, uh, sort of resource challenge that I'd, I'd love to hear Claire's thoughts on that. Cause she's, she's really at a really critical part um, as are we, as are we all, but, but I, I think Daryl is also right at the, uh, you know, has faced that in his many different uh, positions. Let me just add one quick word to that, and thank you. Um, I think that, you know, if you look at where the students are going, you know, for example, at Berkeley, they're, they're all doing robotics and AI, robotics and AI. Um, to be able to work on, you know, robotics and AI, but work on it for safety critical systems, we need to make sure that they're also you know, physically grounded in the mathematics, in the physics, in the dynamics, in the propulsion, in the, you know, that they understand and are trained also in the basic disciplines. I mean, I believe that they should be doing control and optimization and AI, but I also believe that to work on these technologies, they need to, you know, you need to have, you, you still need those basic disciplines for our engineers of the future. And the combination is really what's important. If I can just add to Claire's point, uh, I agree with her. Um, in all of our engineering disciplines, every discipline, it could be chemical engineering, it could be mechanical, it could be material science. Everyone now has to take two courses in AI and machine learning. Uh, that's in the discipline. And then in the design experience, instead of it to be compartmentalized in a particular discipline, it now has to be multidisciplinary so that you don't have these biases and you have you can form these wonderful integrated teams and it's across from engineering into science into computer science into other areas and even into social science. And if we do that, 
we can provide you know better work skills and better skilled employees for you guys as we go forward. But it's got to be multidisciplinary. It's got to be systems based, and it's got to include the AI, the robotics, and the machine learning. So that's kind of what uh, where most universities are moving. The time constraint that I have on me to moderate the q and is as constraining as the legroom in an airplane here. So I'll uh, ask my final question here and then uh, turn it over to Al Romig and John Tracy to wrap up the session here. So here's my personal question. And I want each and every one of you to answer, uh, preferably at a tweet uh, length. Um, looking back past 15 years or so from your respective experiences, perspectives, uh, what has personally excited you, maybe even surprised you? How about we start with Daryl? I, I think for me, um, you know, the revolution in autonomy um, that we've seen, and I was there as a DARPA program manager in 2003. And I remember, you know, we didn't think it was going to work and it didn't work the first time, but <laughs> it helped get bring teams together in these interdisciplinary ways that had never been brought away, brought together before. And look where we are today. Every car manufacturer is working towards autonomous vehicles. Uh, and that would not have been spurred this fast if that didn't happen about 15 years ago. So mm, very good. John Langford. <laughs> Uh, I would say uh, the rise of entrepreneurship and the uh, the reemergence of startups in our in our business. Which for years the line was, oh, it's the barriers to entry are too high, and now we all know that's not true. There's been a lot of of uh, sort of structural changes and technology changes, but the rise, the recent success of a startup company like SpaceX, which didn't exist as the century started, um, and now has helped the U.S. return to. Uh, to space, so I would, and that's incredibly inspiring to uh, to young people. And so I would say the rise of the, of, uh, the reemergence of of entrepreneurship. Very good, Claire Tom. Um, I both of the former, but for me, I think personally, um, going from in a university, going from a, a a concept, an algorithm, a methodology, doing simulations building a test bed, an aircraft multi-vehicle test bed, flight testing the results and showing success, going through that like pipeline that you and companies do all the time, but doing it in a university with students and then graduating those students and seeing them go on to their careers as professors, the most exciting thing. Very good. Alan Epstein. I think the most surprising thing to me is, is when I was just a professor, I thought the science was the hard part and, and the engineering design. And when I went to industry and worked in engineering, yes, I saw the design was tough. But what I didn't realize, the hard part was actually making the stuff at a quality and a price that made the enterprise viable. And I think in much of the engineering departments uh, around the country, there's too much emphasis on the engineering science, not that there can be too much, and not enough on the realities of manufacturing stuff is really important and hard. Very well. Uh, Curtis? Uh, yes, I would say um, certainly the tech startup, that's brought on so much infusion. But to me, what's really excited me in the last 15 years is just the diversity that's coming to uh, the workforce in aerospace. Still a long ways to go, but you know, I'm not all longer the only woman or the only person of color in the room. And that is so exciting. And if we really want to achieve all the things we talked about, we need uh, everyone. Very good. How about Gene Body? For me, it's uh, the, the the equilibrium, you know, the, the, uh, between a good uh, engineering practice and science. And uh, you know, I, I have seen lately, uh, both in Airbus and here with my uh, startup, uh, I have seen things where people have you know switched everything to intelligence uh, software. Uh, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, you know, when you make an airplane like this one uh, that you see behind me, there is a lot of good engineering that has to take place. And Alan said, talked about the quality of what you do. You know, at the end of the day, you fly people up there 
it's not like in a car, you know, I, I worked 30 years of my life in a GM and, and in cars. And, you know, when you had a problem, at least you can go on the side of the road. When you put people up there, uh, you have to make sure that all those things integrate in a flawless way. So what I'm trying to say is, yes, technology has gone, science has gone exponential in the last 15 years. But the good principles of construction, the good basics have to be still there. Otherwise, you may you know, disappoint yourself. And we have seen many of those examples lately, specifically in electric aviation. Well put. Kevin. <laughs> All right. Hey, um, I, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's where aerospace has gone and, and the vibrance of, of the field. Um, I remember when I started uh, aerospace engineering in 1982 at the University of Maryland, I was asked, uh, why would you go into that field? It's a mature field. Uh, there's not much new going to happen. And wow, how long that was. Um, and uh, so I, I think, you know, sharing some of the other thoughts, the entrepreneurialism, look who's getting into aerospace. It's not just the, the big primes, the traditional. It's uh, Google and Apple and Facebook and SpaceX and, and, and all these. I think it's very exciting and portends uh, an exciting future for the air, for aerospace. I want to personally thank all of you for joining. And before I turn it over to Al and John to wrap it up, uh, I wanted to add that there are several more perspectives in this uh, summer 2020 issue on aeronautics, um, like John Garrick's piece on proactive risk management, and of course, ethical aspects of aerospace design. And there's this richness, variety of perspectives, and the full issue is available for free download. Uh, if you go to nae.edu slash the bridge, and uh, you'll, you can find the entire PDF of this uh, issue and all of the issues previously published. So once again, thanks to all the speakers on my behalf. <laughs> uh, I've learned uh, quite a bit not uh, being an aerospace engineer. And I'll now turn it over to Al Romig and John Tracy for their reflections and wrap up. Uh, let's see, I, I wanna answer your last question <laughs> first. Uh, the thing that excites me the most is the level of excitement in the general public for aviation and aerospace. You know, in the 50s and the 60s, the whole world cared because the future of the world depended on, on the space race, et cetera. When we got to the 70s, people in the 80s, as Kevin pointed out, people started caring. There would be launches to the moon that would be not covered. The same thing happened with the shuttle, shuttle launches that were of no interest. But when the shuttle was retired, and they flew it over on the top of a 747 across many cities in the US, you real, I realized there was this pent up interest in space and aerospace where people would line the streets, they would stop on the freeways to see the space shuttle. And that general public interest has continued to grow as we've seen you know, the current, as was pointed out with SpaceX, uh, urban mobility, et cetera. So the thing that's excited me the most is the excitement that's re-emerging in the general public. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Al to close this off. You know, I, I would add a comment to that too, John, and I, I completely agree with you that there's something magical about flight, whether it's in the air or, or in space. There's something magical about flight that really captures the imagination of the young. And there are many, many people who end up majoring in a STEM field, including engineering, who were first inspired as very young children by things that they saw involving flight. So it is really, a, really a, an intense emotional connection. I guess human beings always wanted to be able to fly. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for a wonderful job. I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank all of the uh, all of the people who participated in the audience, who sent in questions, etc. Um, as Guru said, you can download a copy of The Bridge. Um, we wish you all, if you're watching it live, we wish you all a, a pleasant weekend uh, and a pleasant end of the summer. And please, everyone, stay safe and healthy as we work our way through the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.